Alright, making a video. Yep. <laughs> really a lousy day today. Ooh, rained all day. Wasn't supposed to, of course. Uh, weathermen suck. And, uh, yeah, I still got this stupid ear thing I can't hear. Um, which is just really annoying. I sort of feel like crap and I keep tripping over sticks. Which is just really bad. But whatever. Uh, life is really not very pleasant lately. Anyway, um, yeah, okay, yeah, number four. Do some more of this talking about this, uh, the implications of knowledge and intelligence and determinism and accountability and just how simple it is. I mean, you know, we are informed of circumstances and they ch it fundamentally changes our behavior. So, in we're sort of robots, you know, once you become sort of an intelligent person, you're sort of guided, and certainly many decisions are made by the information you acquire. Um, it's almost like, say, if you were going to have a kid and you found out that you had a genetic defect, and there was now a 50-50 chance the kid would be, you know, born retarded or something, it would probably change your behavior. It would be like, no, I really don't want to mess with that. You know, I don't want to have to abort a kid, and I don't really want to, you know, you just forget about it. So that might be your decision, because you calculate now through your changed understanding. So now you appreciate the risk. So it's always, I mean, knowledge is obliging. As soon as you know something, then you're obligated. Knowledge just obligates. Just kind of you know, not in a, uh, you know, you can't, it's not like you can't defy it. I'm just saying it, it creates um, uh, a change in the balance of power within your psychology. And it will tip decisions that were marginal uh, one way or the other. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, so that's the part of us that is just being... Um, in a sense, um, controlled by the determinism of our edification as a human species, in a way. We're all um, part of the fodder for this, um, you know, evolution of knowledge and understanding. And that's sort of the, it's becoming the more dominant, in my opinion, the more predominant element of um, human behavior. So instead of us being controlled by natural impulses, as we were maybe 100,000 years ago, where if we felt like fucking we'd fuck and we did whatever the fuck we want, pretty much. I mean, we did what we... We acted on our impulses. We might even uh, accidentally commit a murder now and then because a fight would get out of hand and uh, the adrenal glands would, uh, you know, take over and uh, tragedy would ensue. And, you know, people have seen that in, you know, primate tribes. Um, you know, where things just get way out of control and everything goes way bad. And it all started with something stupid, like, you know, somebody stepped on somebody's toe or something. Um, and so, yeah, we're sort of past that now because we're smart enough to recognize these warning signs of things getting out of control and... You know, we understand the psychology thing. We understand the the ethics and the the future consequences that you can't undo a murder and all that kind of stuff. I mean, unlike primates, we can understand that some mistakes are permanent, and you have to be careful not to make uh, permanent mistakes. You want to make mistakes you can correct for that. There's some possibility to mess with the painting and, you know, fix the bad brush strokes that might be in it. Um, yeah, that's probably a good metaphor. Uh, you know, and, and that's sort of one of these things that, you know, the word enlightenment uh, might gain you appreciation of, is that uh, the, the difference is, is you don't want to do something that you can't fix. Uh, you know, fixable mistakes are okay, unfixable mistakes 
you want to kind of be fail safe on. You, know, but the, you just don't want to make, uh, you just don't want to go there if you can avoid going there. And that would be a kind of a logic and a kind of discipline that you'd apply to your life. And so I guess I'm just arguing that many people, not most, I don't know, but you know, many, have acquired those kinds of disciplines and are kind of careful and responsible in how they behave is they have learned uh, that recklessness is bad, you know, thoughtfulness good, um, little basic lessons of life, and, uh, you know, they try to um, mitigate against stupidity. Um, you know, it's like even somebody, you know, they sort of, people can learn how to drink over time and learn what their limitations are. And they might even learn that they just can't do it right. And so they don't do it. <laughs> they just say, I'm not going to mess with it because I really can't draw lines properly. And, uh, you know, it always kind of goes bad. So they learn through experience that this is just something not worth it. Um, because, you know, they measure the results. And what happens each time I get a whim to have a, you know, a reckless bit of fun and they realize that, oh yeah, that's when I broke my leg and that's when I got into that fight and that's when I got arrested and that's when I'm this, you know, and they realize that, oh yeah, nothing good comes of it. It's not therapeutic. It's very destructive to my welfare as I have to pay a high price uh, for those silly indulgences, um, but then this is probably it's probably this is probably a worthwhile conversation about just the idea of this fun word that people use all over the place, and uh, you know how to gain your satisfaction. So I'd say that's another piece of this intelligence thing is understanding that you are just a psychology. It's really not about what you personally like what your favorite color is or any of that stuff. It's about the fact that you have a favorite color. It's like somebody who enjoys baseball. It doesn't really matter what team they're rooting for or what team they hate. It just matters that they enjoy the competition and the, and the, the excitement of the contest and the drama. And that's all they're feeding on. Like a soap opera, they're just feeding on the drama. And, uh, you know, the ideal, rationally, you say, well, if I could reform myself, change myself, modify myself, um, wouldn't I modify myself recognizing efficiencies, recognizing that I should be low maintenance, not high maintenance, that I should derive my pleasures inexpensively, not expensively. So if I can reduce what's required uh, to, gain my, to gain what I'm feeding on, so I don't need the whole big, it's like, a, you know, it's like you don't need the King James Bible you know, with all the fancy gold on it and all the little fruffle frills and the you know, leaf on the pages and all that shit because you like the Bible, you want to read the Bible, you just need a book, a Bible, you know, pages with writing on them. This, this idea of, uh, you know, not wasting, uh, not um, squandering to gain what it is you're trying to suck out of something. I mean, it's not a great example, but I just mean, I mean, everything is, uh, you know, can be re, you can, you can weed the superfluous out of your, uh, um, which you're, which you're feeding on. And I guess it comes down to something as simple as just feeding on what you're feeding on. And food would be not only a, an actual an example, but it's also a good metaphor. But, uh, you know, you can change what it is that gains you satisfaction in terms of food choices. You can change your diet and modify it, make it more um, productive and simple, more um, efficient in terms of getting you what you need, giving you the gratification you need without being very expensive or time consuming to prepare and, you know, uh, do you really need imported chocolate and imported that and French this and 
you know, and you could realize that, no, I really don't. I just need a beer to be a beer. <laughs> you know, I don't need it to sing and dance. Um, that kind of thing. And you can, you know, uh, quite deliberately do some of this. But I'm just saying it would be even these better if we could just choose. We could just modify our character, our, our subjective character, our tastes, preferences, and prejudices, and likes and dislikes. If we could just press a button and conform them to a shape so we could choose uh, to be more efficient. Um, the only catch would be is that we're so prejudiced, so attached to some things that uh, we'll, we'll not be able to get past that and think there's something fundamentally incomplete if you extract something we value out of the world. Um, you know, so you can enjoy, say, ballet or something, and you can say, okay, you could extract that from my life. Um, I can find other things that are enjoyable and pretty and artistic and all that kind of stuff, but there would be a part of you that might just say, no, it's not right to not have that in the world because your attachment is just prejudicing you. You can't envision the world as being complete without that. And it's just a, a subjective, um, um, you know, it's an addiction. Uh, you know, uh, I, mean, I certainly can see it with the, my relationship to nicotine throughout my life. Um, very, you know, mutually, <laughs> well, it wasn't mutual. I wasn't giving nicotine anything. But yeah, I enjoyed smoking. Um, I didn't like some aspects of it, you know, burning holes and everything, but uh, I certainly enjoyed the psychological experience uh, of nicotine addiction and satisfying it, and the relationship was uh, good. And uh, even when I would say, you know, yeah, I, I could live without nicotine, live without cigarettes, it still didn't seem right. So it just seems, just from habit and tradition for me, that smoking is just part of how you live. So it was always part of how I lived. So now I've had to live without it. Uh, I still get the nicotine through the e-cigarette, but I don't do the smoking part. Um, and it's easier to envision now with some time off. Uh, but I still have a, a hankering for it. You know, it's easier for me to say as a statement, oh, yeah, this is a stupid thing they should have never invented. But it's still, um, it's still personally, um, um, you know, I'm still personally um, wanting, uh, you know, desiring. And, <clears throat> but there's no reason to it. It's just purely a subjective thing not a rational thing. It's not reason-based. It's purely psychology-based. And, you know, that's, um, you know, sort of, you know, the recognition here that, hey. Go for your swim? <laughs> probably. <Good. laughs> um, yeah, neighbors of the people I swim for. <laughs> yeah, I'm really a mess. That's why I say probably. Because, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My ears are really bad. <clears throat> ah, no permanent damage, hopefully, but I don't know if this keeps happening. It's not good. Anyway, so, yeah, I'm just rambling a little here. Uh, so the point I'm trying to get at is just that I think if we're calm and rational and uh, try to be unemotional, we can recognize that all this mush that we value is just that mush. It's entirely perceptual. The only thing that really has value is the welfare of sentient creatures. Everything else is just a way of you consuming, a way of you feeding 
uh, very crude necessary impulses and that value is in many cases quite modifiable you can change those basic reactions you can bend them and modify them uh, to suit a more rational perspective and so I guess I'm arguing that in many ways we do that in terms of establishing ideals and uh, uh, political agendas where we're not terribly emotionally attached but we know it's the right thing we know the principle is correct and we have a we, have a, we can a, acquire a strong emotional attachment a personal subjective attachment to the intellectual concept because the intellectual concept is solid and we appreciate it and we gain a we gain a subjective investment in it and so this is a way of a, a very positive blending of our subjectivity with our intellect is in this way of allowing what the in, allowing the intellect to seed our our goals seed our um, fundamental sensibilities to make us more aware and therefore more uh, careful and uh, sensitive and cautious and respectful and a lot of these other things of the need uh, you know sometimes to modify our behavior to take the the waste out of our life and to attempt to maximize our efficiency and I suppose that's a really good subject too is this just this comparison between doing the bare minimum and uh, attempting uh, the, the magnificent and I used the metaphor before about jumping through hoops and that it's not too much to expect people to be able to walk through very big hoops and uh, but we certainly should applaud when a person takes on the challenge of going for perfection going for the little tiny hoops you know very high in the air with big giant knives on them and uh, you know if they can master the difficult the challenging the sacrificing uh, yeah you have to applaud the grenade jumpers and such uh, the people who go beyond the minimum and uh, challenge themselves to be grand to be even spectacular uh, so yeah um, and you know some people would argue that these are not real distinctions in the world and they're real distinctions there are people who are doing the minimum and there are people who are trying to do a lot more and if we're going to subsidize something if we're going to applaud something we should be applauding the ones who are trying harder oh, I never turn the filter on as requested anyway and such <laughs>